I'm going to talk about suffering and whether suffering makes you stronger, so you can let me know at the end of the, the <laughs> session how you're feeling. Um, right, I want to talk over the next 30 minutes um, about Nietzsche uh, and about his philosophy. And I want to share with you some of my reflections about victimhood and survival following adversity and to consider what scientific evidence, if any, is there to support Nietzsche's assertion that emotional pain and suffering are not only compatible with, but necessary for fulfillment and for achieving anything good. And to do this, I intend to draw on three main sources of knowledge and experience. The first is through my research with victims of sexual and domestic violence, with family members of homicide, with people whose lives have been shattered by torture and war. The second is my experience as a forensic psychiatrist treating patients with severe mental illness whose actions have created victims, but who also have had to combat experiences of childhood abuse and neglect, institutionalization, stigma, and social exclusion. The third relates to my personal history. My grandparents and many other members of my family were killed in the Holocaust. My parents came to this country as refugees. My father, who rose to the top of his field as a psychiatrist, remained committed throughout his life to working with and advocating for traumatized and excluded individuals before going on to explore the relationship between mental suffering and creativity in his book, Muse in Torment. Now, while I would not identify myself as either a victim or a as a survivor, the legacy of the Holocaust has undoubtedly influenced my choice of career as a forensic psychiatrist and my particular research interests in psychological trauma, stigma, and social exclusion as they affect both victims and mentally disordered offenders. And I will return to this theme at the end of the talk. So, does suffering make us stronger? Now, to start to explore this, I want to consider a bit of history and context, specifically in relation to crime victims, which has been my special field of interest. The scientific study of victims of crime, victimology, was first described as a subdiscipline of criminology by Benjamin M Mendelssohn in the 1960s. But it was not until a decade later that the victim's perspective began to be seriously addressed in the academic and scientific literature including the publication of the first journal of victimology. In 1980, a new diagnosis, post-traumatic stress disorder, arrived on the scene. And this was important because for the first time, it allowed claims of suffering to be quantified, researched, treated, and more importantly, compensated. It gave the suffering of victims a legitimacy and respectability and a voice that had hitherto been denied. Now, since the 1980s, the way in which victims of crime are perceived, defined, and responded to has changed unrecognizably. Victims of crime have moved from being belittled, denigrated, or ignored to having a real and powerful voice. In the UK, we have a highly active and influential victims' right move, rights movement. Victim impact statements are read out in court. There are self-help campaigning groups for victims, national victim commemoration days for innocent children, victims of aggression, for victims of torture, victims of murder and of drunk drivers, and Holocaust Memorial Day. And with growth of what's been described as a trauma industry has come the less edifying spectacle of hierarchies emerging, with victim groups vying with each other as to who has suffered most whose suffering is most legitimate, who is most deserving. Clearly not all victims are created equal or attract similar levels of compassion or care. At the top of the hierarchy is a true victim who is completely innocent of any wrongdoing and therefore deserving of sympathy. But at the other end of the spectrum are the bogus or blameworthy people who are considered to have contributed to their suffering in some way, but who have lied or exaggerated to obtain compensation 
or to avoid responsibility. Two concepts that have been particularly damaging for victims of sexual and domestic violence are false memory syndrome and victim precipitation. So I'll just describe those very briefly. False memory syndrome was first coined by Peter Freyd in the 1990s after he was accused by his daughter of sexually abusing her as a child, a claim that subsequently transpired to have been a complete fabrication. Now, whilst there is no real evidence, in fact, to suggest that false allegations of rape are common, uh, indeed, Keir Starmer's 2013 uh, review found that false allegations of rape and domestic violence amounted to less than 0.06% of all prosecutions over a 17-month period. Nevertheless, the idea that women and men are prone to lie or fantasize about these experiences continues to be expressed in the media, in the courts, and even in our consulting rooms. Now, the idea of victim precipitation came about after a criminologist, von Hentig, discovered that in a proportion of homicide cases, the person who ended up being killed had, in fact, been the first to show aggression, for example, by producing a knife. These cases von Hentig described as victim-precipitated crimes. Now, he considered that the victim, sorry, he considered that the criminal would not have acted as he did were it not for the provocation or reckless behavior of his victim. And by this logic, the criminal becomes the victim of his victim, whilst the victim becomes responsible for causing or precipitating his or her demise. Are you keeping up? <laughs> Are you following this? <laughs> Good. Um, now, although victim precipitation, otherwise known as the art of shifting responsibility onto the victim, was developed around homicide encounters, it is frequently applied in relation to victims of domestic and sexual violence, who probably more than any other category of crime victim routinely find themselves criticized and held responsible for what they did in causing the attack or failing to prevent it. And there is no doubt that social attitudes such as these contribute to feelings of shame and guilt and undermine the psychological and social recovery of victims, as well as their willingness to seek help or to engage with the criminal justice system. I'm just going to say something about what the impact of trauma is on individuals who experience it. Contrary to the notion that that suffering confers strength, there is in fact overwhelming evidence to show that traumatic life events are associated with a range of negative health and social outcomes across the lifespan. The psychiatric effects of abuse, violence and neglect include post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, substance misuse, and psychotic illness, as well as damage to self-esteem, confidence, identity, and the capacity for secure attachment, something that Jill's already talked about. And the effects are cumulative. That is, the more abuse suffered, the worse the mental health and social outcomes. Now, this study by the Centre for Public Health in Wales found that children who had experienced four or more adverse life events and these included physical or sexual abuse, having parents with a mental health problem or alcohol or substance misuse problems, were more likely to drink excessively, to take drugs, to be a victim of violence, to perpetrate violence, or to have ended up in prison. So not much evidence of resilience or strength there. However, some would argue that adversity and harsh treatment that falls short of major or life-threatening trauma may actually be character-forming, as illustrated in the following quote in The Scotsman by a former pupil of Gordonston. Although Courtan, who was the headmaster, resorted to corporal punishment, I can confidently say it did me no damage at all. It taught me a good lesson, and since then I have been disciplinarian. <laughs> So presumably having regular beatings, cold showers, and being made to run a mile in your underpants every morning is more likely to be perceived as beneficial in conferring resilience if you're paying for the privilege. 
similar treatment of children elsewhere would probably lead to them being judged as irreparably damaged and being removed by social services. But in fact, what Ben Arkell appears to be hinting at is the notion of post-traumatic growth, which has recently been used to describe positive change from traumatic events, such as heightened appreciation of life, more meaningful personal relationships, a change in life priorities, increased self-reliance, deepening spiritual or existential connections. It's a nice thought. However, the science behind it is shaky, to say the least, because most accounts alluding to post-traumatic growth, as with the hapless Ben Arkell, are highly subjective and appear to represent little more than relief at having survived, combined with some attempt to make sense of one's suffering. More persuasive evidence as to the possible benefits of adversity and suffering has come from a group of researchers in New York who looked at the long-term impact of different adverse life events in over 2,000 people. Now, they found that people who reported moderate cumulative exposure to adversity had better mental health, lower functional impairment, higher satisfaction, and they were less negatively affected by further adverse life events compared with individuals who reported either no exposure or high levels of adversity. So what these findings seem to suggest is that cumulative adversity, that is the sort of setbacks or hardships that any of us might experience in our lives, provides individuals with an opportunity to develop a sense of mastery and control. They sort of become psychophysiologically toughened up. This opportunity is denied for those individuals who experience high adversity because they are merely overwhelmed by their experiences and it is also not available to people who are never exposed to adversity. Schopenhauer considered uh, that in order to be happy and fulfilled, one should avoid all stress and misfortune. In fact, you should live your life in a metaphorical fireproof room, metaphorically equivalent of a fireproof room. But these findings would appear to suggest otherwise. Now, even with extreme or life-threatening trauma, there is evidence that strategies that allow the individual to retain a sense of mastery and control over themselves and their situation, even if illusory, are protective and confer, if not strength, then at least a degree of resilience in the long term. For example, we know that rape victims who try and retain a degree of control during the attack and who engage in mental planning, for example, looking for an escape route, trying to remember details of their assailant, uh, figuring out how to reduce the risk of physical harm, do better in the long term in terms of psychological health and social functioning and reduced rates of victimization compared to those victims who simply dissociate and give up uh, on any form of mental or physical resistance during the attack. Mental defeat in the face of overwhelming fear and uncertainty has been described by Ehlers and Clark as a state of giving up in one's own mind all efforts to retain one's identity as a human being with a will of one's own. Now we see this state of mental defeat emerging across a whole range of traumatic events, including rape and torture and it has parallels with what psychiatrists might call depression or what behavioral psychologists have identified as learned helplessness as seen in victims of repeated <coughs> domestic abuse. So what do we mean when we speak of strength through suffering? Now although the focus of research in the field of trauma and understandably the focus for psychiatrists has been on those individuals who develop post-traumatic psychiatric illness a more challenging question, perhaps, or a more interesting question, is why do the majority of people remain apparently, at least in psychiatric terms, undamaged and unaffected by the experience? Indeed, even following the most horrific traumatic events, we see examples of people who show extraordinary dignity and moral courage in their refusal to be defeated or cowed. It's a two-minute video, um, and I just want to think about 
um, what he says in terms of what it tells us about suffering and survival. On Friday night, you stole away the life of an exceptional being. The love of my life, the mother of my son, but you will not have my hatred. I do not know who you are, and I don't want to know. You are dead souls. If the God for whom you kill so blindly made us in his image, each bullet in my wife's body would have been a wound in his heart. Therefore, I will not give you the gift of hating you. You have obviously sought it, but responding to it with anger would be to give in to the same ignorance that has made you what you are. You want me to be afraid? To cast a mistruthful eye on my fellow citizens? To sacrifice my freedom for security? You are more powerful than all the world's armies. In any case, I have no more time to waste on you. I need to get back to Melville, who is waking up from his afternoon nap. He's just 17 months old. He'll eat his snack like every day and then we're going to play like we do every day. And every day of his life, this little boy will insult you with his happiness and freedom. Because you don't have his hatred either. Antoine Eris. Right. I wanted to play that uh, because it, I found it a very moving testimony, as I suspect you will all have. Um, Lyris's refusal to define himself as a victim, or as a, I suspect as a survivor, his stoicism and his self-restraint in the most difficult of circumstances is admirable. What is less clear, however, is whether his refusal to express or acknowledge any anger or hatred towards those who perpetrated this violence will be enough to protect him, or for that matter, their four-year-old son, from the damage done to their worlds. Clearly, he is an example of great resilience, but whether or not the experience keeps him strong in the long term remains to be seen. There is no clear evidence to demonstrate whether anger is protective or corrosive, although it is interesting to note that in relation to victims of rape and domestic violence, replacing feelings of guilt, with a, uh, guilt and self-blame with anger towards the perpetrator can be a sign of healing and recovery provided that such hatred does not become all-consuming and one's raison d'etre. Leris also illustrates what is a recurring theme in much of the trauma literature, that a person's state of mind or their attitude towards their own victimization is a key factor in determining whether they remain in a permanent state of victimhood, which shapes their identity and their relationship to the world, or as a survivor. So in the last five minutes or so of this talk, I want to briefly consider what this state of mind might be by returning to some of the direct testimonies of Holocaust survivors and their children, a subject that has always had particular emotional significance for me. I want to start with a quote by Viktor Frankl, which I'll let, allow you to read, or I'll read to you, the way in which a man accepts his fate and all the suffering it entails the way in which he takes up his cross gives him ample opportunity, even under the most difficult circumstances, to add a deeper meaning to his life. Now, at first sight, this may not appear to offer any great insights into the nature of suffering. However, its meaning perhaps changes when one learns about the context in which it was written. Now, Vic Viktor Frankl was a Jewish psychiatrist practicing in Vienna in the 1930s before he was transported to Auschwitz where he was placed in charge perhaps ironically of trying to prevent those prisoners who had not already been murdered from committing suicide. In his book Search for Meaning which he wrote in 1946 he describes how he was able to retain a sense of purpose and meaning in his life by focusing on the beauty of nature around him. For example, a bird alighting on a 
on a pile of earth or the sun setting behind some mountains. In addition, by retaining the capacity to think freely, this provided him with a temporary mental escape from the ever-present threat of death and destruction that surrounded him. The ability to find meaning despite one's suffering has also been found to be protective in victims of torture. So interestingly, political prisoners who are tortured because of their political beliefs have lower rates of psychiatric morbidity compared with non-political prisoners, perhaps because they are able to make sense of their suffering rather than regarding it as completely arbitrary, unfair, and outside their control. There is a real tension for victims of the Holocaust and severe psychological trauma between the wish to forget because of the pain induced by memories and the duty to remember. Primo Levi, a Jewish-Italian chemist who also survived the concentration cap camps, encapsulates this tension beautifully in his book, The Drowned and the Save, when he writes, a memory evoked too often and expressed in the form of a story tends to become fixed in a stereotype, in a form tested by experience, crystallized, perfected, adorned, which installs itself in the place of the raw memory and grows at its expense. Now, Primo Levi and the psychiatrist, another a psychiatrist, Bruno Bettelheim, who was also deported to Auschwitz, both used their experiences to bear witness as to what had taken place, to, if you like, shine some light into the darkest of places imaginable, in their writings and in their work. Both of them, however, ended up committing suicide at the end of their lives. So should this be seen as an act of weakness and defeat, or did it maybe represent for them a final act of defiance and strength by taking ultimate control of their destinies? The alternative to remembering and remaining in a state of permanent victimhood has been to forget, to deny, and to stay silent. And this was a strategy adopted by many Holocaust survivors, sometimes through choice, although often because they were faced with a world that simply did not want to hear. As a coping strategy, this appears to be relatively successful. In fact, it's, it's pretty remarkable that rates of psychiatric disorders in this group are so low. A recent study published by Sharon and colleagues found that six decades later, there was no excess of psychiatric morbidity in Holocaust survivors compared with non-victims. However, the strategy of burying memories or not mentally engaging with a trauma by direct victims of the Holocaust seems to have been rather less successful for second generation survivors. Indeed, many children of Holocaust victims talk about the silence, the ever present sense of threat and fear, the absences as being infinitely more frightening and oppressive than anything that might have been spoken or acknowledged. In her book, Motherland, Rita Goldberg describes how this affected her subsequent relationship with her mother, who was a survivor of the camp and whose entire family was wiped out. Learning to build a wall and compartmentalize pain and conflict helped her to survive, but created a remoteness that distanced her even from us. She buried a part of herself so deep it remained impenetrable. So it would appear that even without talking about what happened, the child is traumatized by a memory of what the parent has forgotten. The traumatic memory is carried from one generation to the next, something that the French psychoanalyst Nadine Fresco described as the transmission of the wound rather than the memory. As with phantom physical pain uh, experience following an amputation, Many second generation survivors experience a phantom emotional pain for what has been lost and suffered by those they never knew as if they have directly suffered the trauma themselves. At one time, the etiology of these effects was thought to be environmental, but more recently, researchers such as Rachel Rehuda in the States have proposed an epigenetic basis to the transgenerational transmission of trauma. Based on her findings, that children of Holocaust survivors with PTSD 
and women with PTSD following the 9-11 attacks had increased rates of PTSD and the associated biological markers uh, compared with children of non-traumatized mothers. She argued that environmental exposure to extreme stress or trauma actually altered gene expression to produce stable and possibly hereditable alterations in the expression of DNA, which then affected not only the direct victims, but also their offspring. I just want to return very briefly to my work as a forensic psychiatrist and my clinical work with mentally disordered offenders. But as Jill has already said, there are parallels to be found between the experiences of many of my patients and with victims of serious violence. Ex stigma, social exclusion and isolation, alienation and abandonment, severe mental illness. They have all experienced terrible events over which they may feel they had little or no control and, or understanding and they all face an uncertain future. But victims are not the same as offenders. And it is very important when working with this group of patients to acknowledge and respond to their experiences of trauma and victimization in a fair and humane way, whilst at the same time acknowledging the harm that they themselves have caused. As Donald Downs wrote in his book, there is a need to serve the demands of responsibility and empathy at the same time. So let me finally return to Nietzsche to say something about him. So just so those of you who don't know, he was clearly a brilliant man. He was made a professor of philology, classical philology at the University of Basel at the age of 24. He was the youngest tenured professor on record, but he was afflicted by adversity throughout his life, including a serious riding accident in his 20s, chronic mysterious physical ailments, which made work eventually impossible. In fact, he retired at the age of 35. He then had a complete mental breakdown at the age of 45, followed by institutionalization, paralysis, and finally death at the age of 54. So adversity and suffering were clearly not unknown to him. But did it make him stronger? It's not entirely clear. But he may have had a point. So what I've tried to talk a bit about today is that some moderate adversity can have beneficial effects. It can be strengthening. But the experience of serious or life-threatening trauma not only causes suffering in the, in the short term, but is likely to have a profound adverse impact on the long-term health and social functioning, both for the direct victim and for their families and for society. But the good news is that recovery is the norm. So the last quote, just to cheer you all up, <laughs> comes from P.G. Woodhouse, uh, whose character, Jeeves, Jeeves, when asked by Bertie Worcester if he should try reading Nietzsche, said, you would not enjoy Nietzsche. He is fundamentally unsound. <laughs> Thank you very much.